Good afternoon, everybody. I'm Alan Cartwright, as some of you know, and I'm a docent on the USS Hornet Sea, Air, and Space Museum. I've been a docent for about 10 years, and I'm going to give you a bit of a tour of the uh, USS Hornet, and then I'm going to talk about myself, which most naval aviators do. Here's a shot of me uh, taken on my first combat cruise on the USS Ticonderoga. By the way, the Ticonderoga is the same class of ship uh, as the uh, USS Hornet, so I'm very familiar with the ins and outs of the ship. And this was taken in uh, probably October, November of 1966. As you can see, I flew the A-4 Skyhawk, which is this airplane. Uh, I flew over 200 combat missions and made over 300 carrier landings. Uh, uh, 70 of those night, uh, carrier landings were at night, and let me tell you, that is not as much fun as a regular daylight landing. I'm going to run you over some uh, parts of the ship. This is a, a big overview. <clears throat> at the back end of the ship, that's called the stern, the front end is called the bow. We have two hydraulic catapults on our aircraft carrier. <clears throat> and this is referred to the, as the island. And I don't know why I picked up that name. My thoughts are that it's got this huge flat deck and this thing sticks up and it's kind of like look, being in the ocean and seeing an island sticking up. You notice here is an S2F, uh, just about ready to touch down. And that's, we have four resting cables. This is ready room four on the USS Hornet. Interestingly enough, when I was on the Ticonderoga, uh, <clears throat> I, my squadron was also in ready room four. And you can see we have wonderful, comfortable seats. Uh, this place was used for a number of reasons. And <clears throat> number one is the duty officer who sat up in the front of the room uh, had communications. He could talk to every part of the ship, other squadrons. Uh, <clears throat> and during, uh, strikes or before strikes, the pilots would meet in here to brief themselves. And you, you would usually start briefing uh, at the air intelligence office, and then you'd come here and, and brief your individual flight. This board is called the Greeny Board. And the, re the reason for that name is when you make an approach to an aircraft carrier, a person at the back end of the ship called the landing signal officer will be watching you. He is basically your last line of defense. He can really help you out if you get in trouble but he grades each one of your approaches. And if you fly a perfect approach, you're gonna catch the number three wire. We have four of them on board. Uh, and if you had that perfect approach, he'll give you an okay three wire, that's your grade. And if you got an okay three wire, you would get a little green mark up on that board. It was always important to the pilots uh, who made the most greenies because they would generally have a couple drinks bought for them uh, when they hit the Oak Club when they got in port. We're gonna do a walk around the flight deck and I'll explain some things on it. We're gonna stop when we look at this F-8 here. If you would stop it now, Heidi. Thank you. The F-8 was a 50s and 60s airplane. It flew a lot in Vietnam. Uh, the pilots called it the last of the gunslingers. And the reason for that is when they developed the next uh, fighter airplane, the F-4 Phantom, uh, they decided, the Navy decided that they had all these super duper missiles to shoot down other airplanes and they didn't need any guns. So they didn't put any guns on the F-4. Well, shortly after the start of Vietnam War, they figured out that they should have put guns on the F-4 because you can get into a hassle or a dogfight with a, a MiG. And if you get within a mile, you can't shoot it down because the uh, Sidewinder missile needs to be further than a mile out. Uh, but the uh, F-8 had four 20 millimeter guns. You can see two of them sitting right here. And uh, <clears throat> they had a great rate of fire and did a great job. <clears throat> if we can continue on now around again, please. We don't have a real good picture of an F-4. We have one on board, but we do have one. If you get ready to stop, we do have one of the F-14. Stop. And this is an F-14, and it replaced the uh, F-4 Phantom. This is called the Tomcat. Some people didn't particularly like it when they decided to name it the Tomcat because it seems to have uh, bad connotations, but the pilots sure loved it. It was a swing wing airplane. What I'm saying is these wings, right now they're in the flight position, and when they get slow or when they're getting ready for takeoff, these wings will swing out 
and become more of a sway, sway, straight wing airplane. It's better than a Mach 2 airplane and it had two pilots, and correction, it had two people in it. There was a pilot and then a radar intercept operator. And the radar intercept operator would find the enemy and uh, get a uh, missile to shoot the enemy, uh, but he couldn't pull the trigger. That was up to the pilot. Next, keep, yeah, there we go. Hit, hit it go. I think it's not going. Ah, there we go. The next airplane you see is a SH-3C King. It's a helicopter. And it's painted just like the helicopters that picked up the Apollo 11 astronauts, uh, which were on the Hornet. If you'll stop it. They also picked up the uh, Apollo 12 astronauts, but we painted this one. It wasn't the one that actually picked them up, uh, but we painted it to look just like it. Okay, start it up. You're gonna see some, <laughs> sorry. You're gonna see some ships over here. It's a ready reserve fleet. They're owned by the uh, Department of Transportation. And if needed, they would be manned by uh, merchant Marines. Uh, about the only thing Navy associated with them is that great paint job. Their job is if we had an emergency and we needed to get supplies somewhere, we could only do it by sea. These guys can be fully loaded and out of here in 96 hours or two days. Over here, you'll see the number, our number two elevator. We have three of them on board. There's one up between the catapults and one behind the island. If you'll stop it, please. This is the F-4 Phantom. And unfortunately, we don't get a very good view of it. It's um, once again, a Mach 2 airplane carried two people, the pilot and the RIO. This rectangular spot here is a jet blast deflector. If you can imagine a jet at full power ready for takeoff on a catapult, there's a lot of hot gases coming back here. And there's airplanes and people back here, they don't want them to get blown around. Uh, this airplane over here is an S-3 Viking. The S-3 Viking is, is an anti-submarine airplane. It can detect uh, submarines and destroy them if need be. And the way it detects them is it drops sauna buoys in the water. It'll drop a series of them, five or six or even more. Uh, and these things are about three and a half feet long or about eight inches in diameter, and they are a listening and transmitting device. And what they're listening for are submarines, and they can uh, figure out where they are by triangulation. They know approximately how deep they are. And something else they know. No two submarines in the water sound alike. You could build two submarines right next to one another with the same people, everything identical, throw them in the water, guess what? They're gonna sound different. And we know the sounds of every single submarine out there. So not only can we find out where it is, we know what country's from, uh, we know its name, and we probably even know the captain's birthday. Okay, if you'll start up again. This is another view of the island. I'll point some things out on the island. When it gets uh, right, when you get the radar in sight, you can stop it for me, please. All right, that's a good stop. Uh, up here is the captain's bridge. That's where the captain spends most of his time. If there was an admiral on board, he has his own bridge. During night ops and bad weather, the pilots are being directed back toward the ship by controllers, and this houses the radars are using. There's a dish radar up here, which gives an airspeed of the airplanes approaching the ship. Uh, there's a video camera right in here, and it takes pictures of all the takeoffs and all the landings from this perspective. It's used as a safety tool and a teaching tool. If there's an accident or incident on the flight deck, they'll have it on video and hopefully be able to analyze it and prevent it from happening again. This is called primary flight control. It is where the, uh, <clears throat> it is basically the tower of the aircraft carrier person up there is called the air boss. He has a lot of responsibilities. One of which is for the safe and orderly conduct of the airplanes flying around the ship. Now you give a naval aviator a hot airplane and his or, idea, his or her idea of orderly around the ship may be a whole lot different than the air bosses. As a young aviator, I participated and witnessed some very strange things happening around aircraft carriers. Luckily for those of us who did it and those who continue to do it, the air boss is an uh, aviator and he probably did the same silly things. This is a search radar. It can uh, find airplanes coming in and it knows their bearing and their distance. This radar will give uh, the people on the ship the altitude of those airplanes. Uh, go to the next slide, please. 
the flight deck is a very dangerous place to work and the Navy doesn't want people up there who don't belong up there. So during flight ops, anybody up there will be wearing a colored shirt. The purple shirts are fuelers. The red shirts are uh, crash and salvage. Being a naval aviator, I often wondered why they didn't call them crash and rescue. My thoughts are they figured if you crash on an aircraft carrier, baby, there's not much chance of rescue. They are also the fighter fighters. Ordnance personnel will also be wearing red shirts. They are the people who load the weapons and arm the weapons. Green shirts are aircraft, <clears throat> excuse me, are, they work the catapults and the arresting gear. The blue shirts are aircraft handlers. And before they had these cute little tugs to tow airplanes around, uh, these guys would get a bunch of them on an airplane, one, two, three, push, and they'd move it around. The yellow shirts are any officers who belong up on the flight deck and aircraft directors. The aircraft directors are the people the pilots watch and they show the pilots where to take their airplanes. White shirts are medical personnel, safety personnel, and certain inspectors. The one shirt you don't see up here is brown shirts. Brown shirts are plane captains. Uh, they have a number of jobs. They're most One of the most important is if a, a previous pilot has written up on the, something up on the airplane, uh, they will make sure it's uh, fixed before the airplane is allowed to go out again. They don't fix it. That's what the green shirts are for. But they make sure it's done. They make, make sure the cockpit is clean. They make sure the canopy clean and the windscreen is clean. But their most important job is when that airplane is being towed around, they're up in the cockpit. If something happens to the coke, to the uh, tow equipment, they will hit the brakes and stop the airplane. <clears throat> This is a video that was taken a number of years ago, and it's a bit of explanation on the optical landing system. So if we could start that. All right, we're looking at the optical landing system. It's uh, on the port side of the landing area. It's what the pilots are watching to give them their altitude altitude information or fly slope information. And what they'll see are these lights right here. You'll notice there's a set of green horizontal lights and in between there's some yellow lights with the red light at the bottom. Yes. If the pilot wants to see if he's on glide slope, he'll see the yellow light lined up with the green ones. If he goes high, he'll see the light go up. If he goes low, he'll see the light go down. And if he gets too low, he'll see the red light. And if he hasn't figured out he's in trouble, there's a guy right here called the landing signal officer Will have figured it out. He hits a pickle switch and that's what the pilot sees. And all he does is full power, raise the nose, go around and crack. Okay. Uh, I was born in, uh, on Groundhog Day, 1942. We lived in Patterson, New Jersey. <clears throat> and uh, we're really lucky because my father was, he worked for. Uh, <clears throat> Uh, he worked for uh, Curtis Wright, and he was uh, deemed necessary to keep the war effort going. So he never got drafted, and we never had to uh, worry about him going off to war. Uh, after the war ended, he moved us out to a place called Lake Opacon, which is out in the countryside of uh, New Jersey, and he'd been there as a kid himself, and he really liked it. And I went to school, started my schooling there at five years old, and it was a rather rural area, as I said. Uh, it was a two-room schoolhouse and it had no running water. For, for heat in the winter, we had a couple of stoves. And for toilets, they were outhouses. It was really rustic. Uh, when I got to be uh, going through school about halfway through my uh, freshman year in high school, my father was offered a job with Curtis Wright out in uh, <clears throat> uh, California, and he decided to take that job. They were going to rework engines uh, out there, and he was offered a management position and took it. You can imagine I was not very happy being uh, 14 years old. I did not like that uh, setup at all. We moved out there in late December. We spent Christmas at, in uh, a motel at uh, on Lake <laughs> in the North Hollywood, California. Not a very camper, happy camper at all. I started school at a place called Birmingham High School, and I found out that they had a swimming team. And I had won some races back in uh, when I was living on Lake Opec on New Jersey. So my mother convinced me I should ask the swimming coach if I uh, could join a team, which I did. And I went to the tryouts. By the way, that was my first time in a swimming pool. And I made the JV team. 
And as the season progressed, I was getting better and faster as a JV. And it looked like I could win the city championships in the 50 free and 100 free. But one day the coach came to me and said, Alan, we have uh, a chance to win the varsity league championships, but we're one freestyler so <clears throat> short on relay. He said, would you do that? And I said, what the heck do I care, you know? <laughs> so yes, I did. And it turns out we did win that relay and we did win the championship. I also uh, qualified for the city championships, LA city championships in the 100 freestyle. And I ended up fifth in that event. Throughout my high school career, I kept getting better and better. After my uh, freshman or after my sophomore year, I learned how to do the butterfly. I got to be pretty darn good at it. And during my junior year, I became all American in the 100 yard butterfly. I continued to get better in my senior year. And uh, not only did I repeat as uh, all American in the 100 fly, but I was all American in the 100 freestyle and I was all American at 200 uh, individual medley and I swam backstroke on a relay that was all American. I was recruited by Ohio State and I went there and I continued to improve. I was all American in the 200 butterfly and I swam a leg on the uh, 400 freestyle relay, which was all American and set a national record. I got out of Ohio State, I did not have a degree. And as you recall, there was the draft and I knew I was gonna get drafted. And I figured I'd been in uh, ROTC, you had to be in ROTC when you were at Ohio State. And I knew that officers made more money than enlisted personnel. So I decided to find out if there was a program with my college education uh, <clears throat> that I could become an officer. So I called the army and they said, well, we don't have a program. I called the uh, Air Force and they said no. And I was smart enough not to call the Marines, uh, but I got a hold of an old Navy, salty Navy chief in Lakehurst, New Jersey. I'd moved back there because my parents were there. And I asked him the same question. And at first he said, well, I'm not sure. And he said, well, wait a minute, do you wear glasses? And I said, no. He said, do you think you'd like to fly airplanes? I said, will that make me an officer? He said, yes. I said, I'd love to fly airplanes. So I took some tests and I became, got a, uh, appointed as a Naval Aviation Cadet. And here's a picture of me as a cadet. Uh, <clears throat> My a friend of mine, who was also a NAVCAD, uh, called us the top 10% uh, of college dropouts. And may, that may or may not be true, but I, it was a way for me to get to be an officer. And I didn't particularly care how I got there, but I wanted to be an officer to make more money. Uh, <clears throat> my class date was 17 of November, 1963. And as you recall, that was shortly before uh, President Kennedy was killed and about a year before the Vietnam War started. The program was uh, 18 months. It was a, a year and a half of training and then three and a half years out in the fleet. I got my wings in uh, the end of June of 1965 and I was assigned uh, to A4s. But before, during the program, uh, two of the airplanes I did fly, the first one was a T-34 Mentor. That was the first uh, airplane I ever flew. Solo did that. And then I went on to the ever popular T2 Buckeye. And that was in the jet pipeline. You either went props, jets, or helos. And I uh, apparently had enough grades to be jets. I also flew the TF9J and the F F11 uh, Tiger. <clears throat> As I mentioned, I was assigned to a squadron out in Alameda, California called VSF-1. And I was to fly the A4s. And what I'm going to do now is walk you around the A4. And if you would please start this, you can notice it's got that funny paint job and that's because the A4 was used as the aggressor airplane for Top Gun. Okay, stop. You can notice this is a two uh, seated airplane. This is a trainer version. That's why it's called the TA4. It also has that funny paint job on it. Why is that? Well, as I mentioned, it was used in the aggressor airplane to most mimic uh, the <clears throat> MiGs that we were fighting in Vietnam. So I guess the Navy decided to paint it up to look a little bit like a North Vietnamese airplane. These are not bombs, these are fuel tanks. This is called a TUR, it's a triple ejection rack and it normally wouldn't be out on this part of the wing. It would either be on this part of the wing or sometimes in the center. And what it did is this is where you put your bombs or rockets and it's called a TUR, it stands for triple ejection rack. It would actually force the bombs off. Uh, this is a slat. A slat is a high lift device. When you get slow, you need to have more lift. And this thing helps you do that as long as well as with the flaps. 
And the way the guy designed this plane, this just doesn't have any hydraulic systems to make it come out like they have on airliners. He wanted to say, wait, so this is an aerodynamic slack. At slow speeds, out it comes. And at fast speeds, the air pressure uh, on the slat forces it back up. And now you have a nice, smooth, fast wing. A little story, I was on my first A4 hop. And uh, as I mentioned, we flew the single seat. So I was all by myself in this airplane with an instructor flying around with me. And he got us up to about 25,000 feet. He says, okay, now I want you to go into a 30 degree bank and uh, pull back the power and hold, maintain altitude. Well, at that altitude, you pull the power off, you're gonna start getting slow. And if you think about it, since I'm in a 30 degree bank, let's assume I'm in a uh, left-hand turn, this wing is gonna be going slower than the outside wing. And eventually this wing is gonna get slow enough that that slat says to itself, my goodness, I'm going awful slow here. I better come out. And guess what happens? This thing comes out, the other one stays in, you get a whole bunch of lift on this airplane and bloop, over you go. It was pretty exciting. And I'm sure the instructor did it to all his new students and laughed his head off. Okay, keep it going. This, uh, we'll get to the other side here shortly. There's a better view of the tur. Okay, stop. Uh, the airplane, this is a, an in-flight refueling probe. And as you saw at the beginning, it has an, uh, an end. And that's how you get fuel when you're airborne. Start it up again. Coming back here you will see a speed brake. Stop. Thank you. The speed brake, uh, there's one just like it on the other side. There's a switch on your uh, thr throttle that when you push it, pull it back, those speed brakes come out. And what it does, it slows the airplane down in a big, big hurry. But it's also used when you're on approach. Now, why would you want uh, something to slow you down on approach? You don't necessarily want, you to want it to slow you down, but when those speed brakes are out, it takes extra power to maintain your speed. And the reason you need extra power is because a jet engine doesn't have instant power like a uh, piston engine does. And it takes a while after you go to full throttle to get that full speed. So with the speed brakes out, guess what? You had to have a little extra power so that you were uh, spooled up uh, for that approach. Okay, next slide, please. When you're flying a jet airplane, you uh, are pretty well dressed up. You have a lot of equipment on, and here's some of the equipment we have. Uh, this is called a Mark III inflator, and when you're in the water, you want to be able to float. You pull a couple handles, and this thing blows up to keep you afloat. Uh, <clears throat> you have a harness. This is a harness, and it goes right in here, and it, the harness attaches you to the ejection seat, which is uh, part of that is the uh, parachute, and also it attaches you to the seat pan, and in the seat pan is a bunch of survival gear, one of which is a one-man life raft, and guess what? They put some uh, shark repellent in there. I don't know if it ever works. I never had to try it. Uh, this, these pieces here are one suit, and there's a belt across here, too, that has uh, air bladders in them. When you're flying around and you pull back on your stick, it forces you down into the seat, and everything about you wants to go down, including the blood from your brain. Well, if you pull too hard, that blood could go down and you could uh, lose consciousness. What this G suit does is there's a hose comes out, and plugs into the side of your airplane. As you pull G, that hose fills up with air, fills up these air bladders, which doesn't allow the blood to go down. Uh, and so you maintain consciousness. You notice this uh, suit is an orange flight suit. Uh, when we're flying in Vietnam, we didn't want to wear orange flight suits. So if you look over here, here's another flight suit. Uh, and it's uh, jungle color, so that if we got had to be in the jungle, you wouldn't get shot down. Also, this one shows uh, light. It's a strobe light. It's very, very bright. So if you're in the water and want to be found, you turn the strobe light on. You also carried a uh, flashlight, and you can see it's got a 90 degree with a red light in it. And at night, when you're getting ready, when you're taking off, you would push the turn that on in case you lost uh, any lights in the cockpit. We also, uh, over Vietnam, we carried weapons. I carried a 38 revolver. Uh, most people did. 
We also carried a knife and a bunch of other stuff. Next slide, please. <clears throat> I was assigned to my first squadron, VSF-1. It was based up here in Alameda. And it was a great squadron, a great commanding officer. Uh, I was a young ensign having a great time. And we were supposed to go out on the Shangri-La on a cruise to the Mediterranean. And I was really looking forward to it. Here I was, a good looking, handsome young uh, aviator gonna go over to Europe and see all those wonderful places and probably uh, run into uh, some uh, wonderful women if I was lucky. Uh, but that was not to happen. An air group commander down in San Diego had uh, gotten rid of four of his A4 drivers for whatever reason, I don't know, but he needed replacements. And we had had a lot of training up there in VSF-1 and uh, four of us were told to go to two attack squadrons, which were gonna be going to Vietnam. So here I was really irritated because instead of going to Paris and uh, Italy and all those wonderful places, I'm gonna go to Vietnam and get shot at. Not a happy camper at all. Here is <clears throat> the USS Ticonderoga. I was in squadron VA-195 and we went out on the uh, USS Ticonderoga, CVA-14. And here's a picture of the Tyco. And it looks like they're getting ready for, uh, to launch airplanes. They're also taking uh, supplies. And you can see these lines. They're fuel lines probably for both jets and uh, the uh, ship itself burn bunker fuel, and they're probably loading that up. Here's a map, uh, map of Vietnam. And this is called Yankee Station. And this is where the carriers would be stationed. We had, usually had three of them out there. And uh, the DMZ was right around here somewhere. Everything up above there, above there was uh, the bad guys, and we had some good guys down below here. Uh, you can see Vin, that was a place I'll talk about in a minute. This is Hanoi, the capital, and Haiphong Harbor. Uh, <clears throat> this, we did a lot of weapon work along the, uh, Highway 1 here, and then we'd have big strikes into Hanoi and Haiphong, uh, also Vin. Here's a picture of me. Pilots man your planes. So I'm getting ready to go out on a mission, and I'm not sure exactly which one this was. Uh, it may be uh, uh, one of the ones uh, that we'll see in a, in a little bit. The way the Navy gave out awards, and I'll talk about that a little bit later, every 10 combat missions you flew, you got an air medal. Uh, I have uh, read air medal write-ups from World War II, and I'll tell you what, I'm a bit embarrassed that I got an air medal for what I did compared to what those guys did. This video will show <clears throat> the, me on my 200th combat mission. You can see here's a picture of the uh, USS Ticonderoga getting to take off. And you'll notice they have the fighters up here. They go out and their whole job is to protect uh, those of us flying attack airplanes. And here are the attack airplanes getting ready to go. Uh, <clears throat> and here are auxiliary airplanes. We had a lot of different types of airplanes going. But this is what we look like before we started. So if you could start the video, please. Here I am coming up to the flight deck. If you'd stop it, please. Uh, this shows you a typical bomb. And I, this, this really isn't, but I just thought I'd like to show. This is the fusing of the bomb. And this is a 500 pounder. And you can see it has a propeller-like device on it. And this is, in fact, effect a propeller and after so many turns it arms the bomb well they run a wire from the airplane uh, through a stationary point here and then through the propeller so when you're flying this thing is not spinning that would be too darn dangerous but when you drop the bomb the wire stays with the airplane pulls out here starts the thing spinning and arms the bomb so if you'd start it up again please coming to the airplane doing a pre-flight getting ready to do a pre-flight give your helmet bag to the uh, plane captain, do the walk around. This, uh, <clears throat> if you'll stop it as soon as we get to here. Thank you. Uh, the mission I was on, that those bombs you see were not on my airplane. These are Zuni rockets and they were a whole lot of fun to fly or to fire. They're five inches, they're about six and a half feet long and about a 75 pound uh, <clears throat> load in them ordnance load and they were fun to fire for a number of reasons number one you point that thing and it was gonna go and uh, hit it uh, but they made this wonderful rumbling sound as they went out and you could fire them singly you could uh, fire them more than one if you liked it was a fun thing to uh, fire okay start up again please 
doing the pre-flight, this next shot's not very, uh, <laughs> not very good. But they took the picture. What can I say? Getting ready, uh, strapping in, hooking up my G suit, hooking up my radios, oxygen, all that other stuff, writing something down, and just waiting for start. And next thing you'll see is I've started up, canopy closed, flaps are down, trim set, and I'm taxiing up to the catapult. The catapult ride is quite a thrill. You get going from zero to about 150 miles an hour in about two seconds, and it really is something else. Off they go. You notice the A4 sinks after the catapult shot because the reason for that is when the slats, the slats go sliding up because of the pressure of the catapult, which doesn't give you your full amount of lift. So it takes a, a split second or so for those slats to come out to give you your full amount of lift. And when that happens be, before the slats come out, the airplane takes that little dip. So you always notice an A4 uh, taking a dip on takeoff. Can you start that up, please? For some reason, it stopped. Well, here's a. This isn't that strike. Obviously, the, you didn't get to see the rest of that, but um, we'll look at this. This was a typical load that the uh, squadron I was in carried. We would carry uh, two 500 pounders, one here, one here, on the outboard and below. And on the inside, we only had a 250 pounder. And the reason for that is. Uh, a 500 pounder wouldn't fit when the gear was down because the gear door would bump into it. So we would go out with uh, 2,500 pounds worth of uh, ordnance if we were carrying this load. Sometimes on a big strike, uh, an alpha strike, they would take off this fuel tank, this 400 gallon fuel tank, and they'd put a uh, mur on it, which would carry six 500 pounders. And that was a very, very big load. So we'd go out with 10, six, uh, 10 500 pounders and the two 250s. Sometimes when they did that to us, we were too heavy for a catapult takeoff. Well, what did they do? You had to get off there. So what they would do instead of giving us a full load of fuel internally, they would take some fuel out. So you'd get launched and you could fly with that heavy weight. So then you would hook up with a tanker and I'll show you some pictures of that happening. Fill up with your fuel, go to the target, come on back and most likely you'd have to fill up on fuel when you came back also. Here is some footage of a bombing run. And you can see if you, uh, once we get going, this airplane is almost upside down. If you'll start that, please. And uh, coming in on a target, you'll see the wings will come level and you'll see, uh, see what he's aiming at. You also see some bombs going off from the airplanes in front of them. And they're right along a river. And my guess is this was a place where the uh, North Vietnamese brought in supplies and uh, they, we decided to bomb the supply places where they're keeping the supplies. You'll start to see that now he's leveling off and there's the guy in front of him dropping the bombs. As soon as you dropped your bombs, you got your nose up, started moving around because they were tracking you and you didn't want them to hit you. Get out of town, you get out over the water because you were safe over the water. Anytime you're over land, there's a good chance you could be shot. Before I get into this one, uh, we used to get SAMs shot at us, surface-to-air missiles. They could come up at about twice the speed of sound. They were pretty mean things. We had gear in our airplanes that could detect them. They could detect the radars, and we would get uh, green lights in there for search radar, which was no big deal. We had those all the time. And then we had acquisition radars, and that was a little more uh, <clears throat> scary because they were painting you and they were getting ready to either fire a surface to air missile at you or fire in an aircraft weapons at you. But the biggest one was when they fired a surface to air missile at you, you would hear a warble in your headset. Doo -doo 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 -doo. It would go and there was a little light in your cockpit that, that was red and it said Sam on it and it would flash. Now, when I heard that doo -doo 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 -doo, I never looked at the Sam light. That was <laughs> ridiculous because you wanted to see where that Sam was. And the way you beat a SAM was, you knew generally where they were going to be coming from. So you look in that direction. And I'll tell you about one of my hops. We were out on a mission to uh, uh, destroy a SAM assembly area. And I was flying with Lieutenant Commander in the lead and a, uh, a Nugget or a new pilot 
<clears throat> in the group and we got the warble and I called it out nothing happened you wait for the guy to do something but darn you don't wait very long because you don't know what's going to happen so I spotted the Sam and the way you beat him is uh, to find out if it's being aimed at you you lower your nose if it lowers its nose baby it is tracking you so there's no hard and fast rule about when you make your defensive maneuver and let's just say that when the pucker factor gets really high you pull back on your stick and uh, get your airplane climbing again. And now these air uh, missiles don't have very big uh, surfaces, control surfaces, and they can't outturn you. So generally speaking, zoom, they go zipping by and up into the sky. Now in this particular mission I'm talking about, I was really relieved because now I could go back to the target. All of a sudden, doo -doo 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 starts again. So I had to avoid another SAM and I was able to do that. Now what this picture is here, <clears throat> you can see uh, there's a stream or a, a river of some kind coming along here, and this is Highway 1. That's where the North Vietnamese ran a lot of their supplies from north to south. And they had a bridge on here. Right here was, was the bridge. And as you can see, uh, there was a lot of bombing going on. Who knows how many bombs and how long this lasted, but the bridge was taken, taken down. My guess is they built another one, and that was taken down. Well, the North Vietnamese weren't uh, dummies. They said, well, we're tired of building that one. So what they did and I imagine that's what this target was, is they would build another bridge and they'd bypass, build a bypass road. And guess what? There's the other bridge. Uh, I also like to point out, you notice how this is all bombed out. And this is what the Navy pilots did. We were really good pilots and good bombers. But I like to point out that the Air Force was also up and around there. And you can see they didn't quite do as well bombing as we did. This next is a little bit better close up. And the reason for this is number one, there's that new bridge. You can see the road coming by. But I also like to point this out. This is where they would have uh, anti aircraft weapons, either surface to air missiles or anti aircraft. And in the center was where the people would uh, live, I guess. And that's where their control equipment is. As you can see, this one is not manned. And uh, I've often wondered why we didn't just bomb this, because even though there's no weapons there, if you bomb it, you are going to uh, <clears throat> cause havoc with them. After a flight, uh, especially a, a heavy uh, flight like I talked about, no 400 gallon fuel tank on here. By the way, this is yours truly tanking off the uh, A3 Sky Warrior. Uh, you would need fuel to get back to the ship. And this is me, as I said, tanking off the uh, a3. And I know it was a big strike, as I said, there's no 400 gallon tank on there. So we had, uh, or I was carrying the 10 500 pounders. The A4 could also give fuel. And if you'll notice, this is an A4. By the way, look at the name. And this is called a buddy store. A buddy store allowed the A4 to give fuel to other airplanes. And what's in here is an air driven. Uh, hydraulic pump and this propeller would spin power the pump and in here was a long hose that would send out a, uh, a, a refueling capabilities and the next picture shows you that happening now this is an a4 uh, with the refueling drogue on it and this i took this picture and as i'm approaching to put that uh, refueling probe in and here's a closer picture this is after i'm plugged in you can see uh, <clears throat> i'm really close in fact uh, you're so close. The A4, as opposed to the A3, the A3 had, had uh, engines on the wing, so it's nice and smooth back here. But with the A4, they thrust their exhaust tank or exhaust was up here, and it would hit your rudder, and you get these little bit of vibrations in, uh, in the airplane. Uh, this is a picture I took of myself, and you can see it's a little out of focus. I took it after one of my strikes, and uh, the thick picture is. Uh, very representative of how I was a little out of focus myself after strikes. Here I am landing after that 200th mission. You could start that, please. Stopping an airplane at 175 feet, going from 130 miles an hour, 140 miles an hour to zero is really something else. It throws you forward, but you're at least back. And I would always go down and get myself a nice shot of VO. Here I am coming out after that mission sweaty as can be captain of the ship congratulates me big smile uh, 
Okay, awards. You get awards, as I mentioned, you get uh, air medals after every 10 missions. And here I am getting my first uh, air medal from the captain of the ship. This is an not an unusual picture. Every time there was an even 1,000th landing made on the aircraft carrier, they had a celebration in the ward room. The pilot was uh, not honored necessarily, but recognized. They'd bake you a cake with your name on it and the number of missions. And I was lucky I made the 91st 1,000th landing and also the 95th 1,000th landing. And to give you an idea how many landings we were making during this uh, war that we we're fighting out over there, those uh, the 4,000 landings were made in a, only six weeks, a lot of flying. Also, you'll notice a <laughs> Snoopy dog. I was a big fan of uh, Schultz's uh, Red Baron series. And my wife sent me a Snoopy dog and I would carry him on my, when I was flying missions. In fact, he probably flew at least a hundred combat missions with me. And uh, <clears throat> He also would be in the cockpit, obviously, when I was landing. And I happened to have him uh, in the cockpit when I made my first, 94, 1st or 95th thousand landing. I don't know which. So the war room heard about it, and they not only gave me a cake, but they gave Snoopy some bones. That is my presentation. I hope you enjoyed it. And I am ready to answer any questions you might have. Ellen, were you flying Charlie's? Say again, sir. Were you flying Charlie's? Yes, the Charlie. I flew all the A4s. I flew all the Bs, Charlie's, uh, Echoes, Foxes, and the Ts, too. But the one I flew in Vietnam was the Charlie. Why do you ask out of curiosity? Well, it looked familiar to me. That was the last A4 I flew. All right. Where'd you fly them? I flew them in the reserves for 10 years. Ah, I think I know who you are. <laughs> all right. Looks like Mary has a question. Okay, Mary. Any other questions? I'm sure you have some, Linda. Come on. <laughs> <laughs> oh, no, I, I, uh, I'm very impressed with your record and your swimming record and all of that. That's just amazing to me. Plus, you're a Buckeye, so heck. By and the then way, when you. When by, the you, way, when 19, you, and by the way, in 1962, we won the NC2A championship. I know. I looked your name up. I ah, found that. You. <laughs> you, you were highlighted you, on the, the net. So did you see Artie Wolf? Believe it. Did yeah. It? Okay. And Thank then a, a friend of mine's husband served on the Ticonderoga. So that was nice to see that. Oh, good. You know, that good. name. Yeah. But thank you very much. You're welcome. Any other questions? I know Steve Lavelle has one about nitrogen, but I won't uh, go into that. It's a personal thing we have. Rich, you got any questions? Well, not really. I just was kind of wondering if they made you swim any place when you were there over there. No, but strangely enough, during my time in the Navy, I did do some competing. They had a race, had a meet up here in uh, Alameda. I also swam one when I was going through, oh no, not Chuck. I also had one when I was going through uh, B, uh, uh, Mississippi, Meridian. They had a meet there. And so that, yeah, that was fun. Alan, do you happen to remember the name of the captain that was greeting you uh, on your 200th landing? He looked really familiar to me and I, I can't place his face right now. I can't remember that. I could probably look it up, uh, Chuck, but no. Do you think he was a Hornet captain at one point? I doubt it. Generally, they only served uh, one year. Oh, there's Buckeyes Bill in back of you. Very nice. That stadium. I, I put that up uh, just for you. you. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, they only would serve one year was about all. So the chances of him being a captain on both ships or two different ships are not very high. Yeah, hey, I do have one more question. When you um, when you make that rotation off the catapult, is that? Uh, I was always thought that the um, you had to make an angle of attack change as well as uh, wait for those slats to come back out, right? 
Well, the slats were almost instantaneously. It was just a very, very short period of time and they would come out because you're only going 130 knots or so. And so they would come out almost instantaneously, so, but you would just get that little bit of a settle. As far as uh, rotation and everything, I had, I developed a method of, on the catapult shot, I would just put my hand right by my waist, right in between my legs. I would not hold onto the stick. And on the cat shot, the stick would come back and I'd grab it. And that just was the perfect attitude for taking off. So Alan, what kind of plane was the Buckeye? Did you say it was a training plane? A yes. jet? Okay. Something I, little, edu little education. When you look at the letter in front of the number of an airplane, it tells you what it does. T is for training and the Buckeye was the T2. Okay. The A4 was attack. The uh, plane that Rich flew was an F-8 or fighter. So you can tell what the airplane does by that uh, letter in front of the number. Oh, thank you very much. Now thank the you. Modern, the modern Navy airplanes are the F-A-18. So they do both fighter and attack. And I have always said or believed that if you have an airplane that does two jobs, it doesn't do them as well as the single one, a fighter, it's an also attack will not be as good a fighter or as a good attack as it could have been if it was just one or the other. But that's my prejudice. So. Thank you. You're welcome. Someone else. And, and those planes were built in Columbus, Ohio, I just read. Yes, the T2 Buckeye was. Yep. Well, that's yeah. probably why I got the nickname. I think so. <laughs> Did someone else have a question? Nicely done, Alan. Thank you, and thank you all for listening. It was an honor. Nicely done. Uh, Steve, you're going to have to put up your uh, Eagle Globe and anchor behind your head instead of the flag for the next one, okay? <laughs> okay. Linda, in case you didn't guess, the six, the five other guys, the five of us you see here are all docents on the Hornet. I know, I just haven't met you. So I, I hope to meet you sometime to show you my ankle tattoo, you know? <laughs> well, yes. Well, the ship's open Friday, Saturday, Sunday, and Monday. And if you really want a tour, uh, maybe we can give you my email address and we can set something up. You can come on down. I'll give you a private tour. Well, as Heidi knows, last week we had uh, 45 kindergartners on board that uh, Heidi and I <laughs> did activities right? with. Oh, ah, okay, okay. Yeah, Linda teaches the kids, Alan. Ah, very good. Yeah, I, very yeah. Good. yeah I'm in the, the education group, so yeah. yeah. But thank you again. You're welcome. Thank you, everyone. Great job, Alan. Thanks. Take care. Bye.